Hello and welcome to Lost Love Chronicles. A knock at the door pulled me out of my thoughts. It was too early for the mailman, so I wondered who would be bothering me at this hour. I glanced over at the TV in one corner of the room. I checked the crib in the other corner. The kid was still sound asleep. Apparently, it was later than I'd realized. Life's a mess. That's probably the gist of it. The knock came again, louder and more insistent this time. I swung the door open, prepared to let loose on whoever was on the other side. But the words caught in my throat when I saw the familiar jerk standing there, his fist still raised to knock. Geez, you look rough, he said with a smirk. Did you bring my check? I asked, my voice flat. Uh, I mailed it, he mumbled, shifting awkwardly from one foot to the other. I came by to see the kid, he added. My lawyer says it'll look better if I show up for most of my visits. Oh yeah, I spat. You're clearly in the running for father of the year. Just remember, you'll be running away from your cellmate if that check is a day late or a dollar short. God damn it, Evelyn. Why do you have to be such a hard-nosed? He whined. You know I lost my goddamn job over this bullshit. I make barely over half of what I did before. And the court didn't take that into consideration. They just jotted down an arbitrary figure and said, pay this amount every month. I don't have to be a hard nose, I said. I just like it. Screwing up your finances is the least I can do, after what you did to me. Shit, you did it to yourself. I was happy. My life was wonderful. You and your tiny Johnny and your big mouth ruined it. So now, we're both miserable. Well, misery loves company and both of us lost, he said. Before all this shit happened, I had never lost at anything in life. I'm a winner. That's what I do. Usually, even when it looks like I'm going to lose, I end up winning. You sound like more of a winner to me. Go sell that shit to somebody who's interested, I said flatly. I pointed towards the crib and turned my attention back to the screen. Maury was on. From the corner of my eye, I saw him standing over the crib. He looked lost. He gave the baby a perfunctory glance and shook his head. Then he looked back at me. Why are you staring at me? I hissed. Your daughter is right in front of you. That's what you came for, right? He spent another few minutes looking in the crib and then his eyes rolled back to me. I turned quickly and caught him. What? I hissed. Your titties look bigger, he said. I just noticed because that robe is kind of open and they don't just look bigger. They're bigger, you idiot. They swelled during my pregnancy and didn't go completely back to size afterwards. I got lucky. I don't have much in terms of stretch marks. Oh, I caught myself before I started crying again. Why are you looking at me anyway? I hissed. I just thought, how long has it been? He asked. You ought to know, I hissed. No, he smirked. Since we? Nobody? Nope, I said. Not once. I haven't even touched myself. So, you um, wanna? He ventured. Hell no. I hissed with all the venom I could muster. He looked shocked and slightly disappointed. Hey, I was just trying to do you a favor, he said. I was suddenly angrier than I had ever been in my entire life. I have no choice, I said angrily. I have to allow you visitation as long as you're paying. But don't talk to me. That isn't part of our deal. Visit the kid and get out of here. He leaned over the crib and stared at the baby. She doesn't look anything like me, he grumbled. Did you fake the DNA test? The court ordered the test. A-hole, I hissed. They sent you to a lab that they approved of. I had nothing to do with the entire procedure. This is what you get for sticking your stick where it didn't belong. And for the next 18 to 22 years you're gonna be paying. Do you even know what her name is? How am I supposed to know that? He said. You and I can barely exchange two words without you going off on me. It takes two to tango, baby, and you were just as eager to dance as I was. Or don't you remember? Screw you. I screamed louder than I should have. You already did, he smirked. That's what got us here. I just can't figure out why you're acting like you don't want to do it again. Doing it the first time was the single biggest mistake of my life. I spat. You caught me at a moment of weakness and I've regretted it ever since. Then why is your robe still open? He smirked. Because there's nothing to hide, I said. You've already seen everything and there is absolutely no chance of anything happening between us. The sight of you makes me want to vomit. I'm telling you. This kid doesn't look anything like me, he said. He waited a few moments. Okay, what is her name? Alex, I smirked. He immediately straightened up and glared at me. I'm not sure he realized that he was doing it, but his hand strayed towards his nose. He gingerly ran his fingers across the bridge of his nose. His nose had a pronounced lump at the top of it. His fingers ran across it as if trying to smooth it out. That takes the cake, he growled. I can't believe you named my kid after that a-hole. 
I can't believe you called her your kid, I laughed. I had to get a court order to force you to have the DNA test done and then another to force you to pay your child support. And while we're on the subject, it's due tomorrow. Not sometime next week. Not whenever you get paid. I have the number to friend of the court on speed dial. They'd be happy to slap your butt in jail and... And if I'm in jail, you still won't get your money, he said. So, you should give me some slack. I never wanted any kids. I laughed at that. Do you think I wanted to get pregnant? I asked. And if I had to get pregnant, why did it have to be you? You're the most worthless a-hole I've ever met. You've always been so stuck on yourself. There's never been any room in your life to love anybody except yourself. That's why you've never had a girlfriend. I've had lots of women, bitch, he hissed. I even had you, remember? See what I mean, I hissed. You're too dumb to know the difference. You never had me, idiot. You screwed me. There was no love between us. We didn't have any kind of bond or any emotional connection. All we did was a workout, nothing more. You were too stupid to know that I was just using you to get revenge for something that I was going through. The terrible thing is that we got a baby out of it. We got a child that neither of us wanted. That means for the next 20 years or so, we're tied together. You ruined my life, and I'm gonna make sure that you're equally unhappy. So, don't drop by here hoping to screw me, cause that ain't gonna happen. And don't come by to make small talk and try to get me to give you any slack at all on the child support because that ain't gonna happen either. But let me give you a glimpse of the future. In three years, that's 36 months. Minus the three months that have already passed, my alimony will run out. I'm going to have to get a job then. And that means our daughter will have to go into daycare. Daycare centers are expensive. So why are you telling me about it? He asked. Because you're going to have to pay half of it, dumbass, I spat. Hell to the no, he said. I'm living on peanut butter and water, right now. My dates have to spring for the drinks as it is. There is no way I can pay you another dime. See, that lack of foresight is what got you into this situation in the first place, I laughed. I just warned you of what was going to happen, so you could pick up a second job. Maybe you should try Uber. Maybe you should learn to keep your legs closed, he hissed. After what you just said, I finally figured this whole thing out. You used me. God damn it, I laughed. I mean, how stupid can you be? It only took you five minutes after I told you that I'd used you for it to sink in. You're a genius. Yeah. Well, this genius is taking you back to court, he smirked. I'm gonna get released from this because of fraud. You admitted to trapping me. How do you like them apples? I've got three words for you, babe. Sing gull pair rent. It took me a second. Then I burst out laughing. That's not three words, you moron, I said. It's two. I meant three syllables, he said. It was four, I laughed. Screw you he said. Maybe you should get a job as an English teacher. You could moonlight editing those internet sex stories. But none of that matters when I go back to court and get released. I'll be free as a bird to go back to my life. Look doofus. Not that I care what happens to the rest of your money after I get my cut. You can spend it on Cialis and prostitutes, if you want, but going back to court is a waste of money. You're going to have to pay court costs, your lawyer's fees, and who knows what else and then you're going to lose. If you're so smart, explain it to me, he hissed. I just read a thing on the internet that said that in a divorce case, everything is supposed to come out 50-50. That means you get 50%, your husband gets 50%, and I get 50%. I didn't get 50%, I lost 50%. They're taking 40% of my paycheck. I had to move out of my condo and into a rat hole that's barely better than this place. I couldn't help it I just started laughing. What's so goddamn funny? He asked quietly. 50 plus 50 plus 50 is 150%, you moron, I laughed. There's no such thing. 100% is all there is. Then there's the fact that the judge did split everything right down the middle. We each got 50% of our assets. See? He hissed gleefully. I didn't get my 50%. I didn't get shit. You weren't a part of the marriage, imbecile, I said. Your case was completely separate. Our case was a paternity case. How can I explain this? So you'll get it. You see when a man. Well in this case you can play the part of a man. Anyway, when a man puts his pee, pee in a woman's hoo-ha, there's a chance that they'll make a baby. You did. We made one. We're here. You have to pay. Case close. Got it? He scratched his head and then smiled. I've got it, he said. They never DNA tested your husband. Tears ran down my cheeks unbidden. What's wrong? You never thought about that, did you? He croaked. It took me a few moments to compose myself with him dancing in victory all the while. Vincent. They tested Bryce when I first discovered I was pregnant. It was my biggest hope. I wanted him to be the father. It was the one thing that might have kept us together long enough to save our marriage. When the test came back, and the results were negative, 
There was no chance in hell of calling off the divorce. God damn it, he said. I win at everything. But maybe this is like school. In school, I always had to take tests more than once to get my D. This was the first test I've ever taken that I passed on the first try. Maybe if your husband took the DNA test again, he could pass it, and then he could be the father. Even if he doesn't get as high a score as I got, we'd have to split the cost of child support, so it wouldn't be as bad. I just looked at him and shook my head. The man was too stupid to believe. Yeah, he gushed. Since I got a 99.9%, I'll be the father. If we could just help him study to the point where he gets better than 50%, they'll let him slide. That's what they did for me in school. Then he can be the stepfather. Shit. Maybe we could do it like they do on TV. You and the kid can live with the stepfather, so I don't have to do shit. Maybe you guys could pay me a big check and I could sign my rights away. Then years from now if she grows up to be rich and famous, I could write a book and tell the world how I was really her father and, and get out of my apartment now. I screamed. Uh, yeah, he said. I'll see you next month. Vincent, I said. What? He asked. Your visits are bi-weekly, I said. I know that dummy, he told me. That means I visit one week, then I get a bi week. That'll put it into next month. No. It means you have to visit her twice a week, I said. Are you out of your mind? He screamed. There is no way. I had to give up my lunch hour for this shit today. You didn't even make me lunch, and all the kid did was lay there on her. We should make it bi monthly or bi yearly. This is so unfair. Why do I have to visit her before she can even talk anyway? Can you explain that to me? This is bullshit. I laughed hard as he walked out the door, slamming it behind him. The sound of the door slamming was all it took to wake her up. Now let's check Vincent's side of the story. Evelyn, I hate that woman. I kept my cool long enough to get inside of the elevator before I screamed it out loud. I hoped that the metal box and the fact that I was between floors would mute the volume of my scream. But it was true. That bitch, that miserable, low-class, trailer trash hooker had been the bane of my existence since the first goddamn time I saw her. Every time I came in contact with her, things went bad. And now she had me by the balls. My life was over. The bitch had me paying for her kid for the next 20 goddamned years. And that kid looks nothing like me. I looked at her. I have no idea what a baby is supposed to look like. I'm not a podiatrist. I don't know shit about kids. Truth be told, I hate kids. I hate him almost as badly as I hate Evelyn Cooper. I only came over here today because I ran into a bit of trouble financially. I was playing poker last night with the worst poker players I have ever faced, but somehow, they managed to clean me out. I lost every dollar I had, and since I'm not much for saving, that was all I had. So, there's no way I can make that damn child support payment. I was hoping to work my magic on Evelyn's dumb but and get her to let me slide. Just this once. Now, I was really in trouble because all I did was pissed her off. I tried to be as charming as I could, but apparently my charm only works on her when she's in the mood. Today, she obviously wasn't. I can still remember the first day I saw her. She was walking around in front of my school. I own that place. I was the running back on a football team with the worst quarterback in the state. His job was to hand me the ball. My job was to pound the rock. Occasionally, he got to throw it. But that was just to open up the line, so I could go for bigger yardage runs. Anyway, I'd already been through most of the viable women in my class and I was bored. I'd been hearing about this Evelyn girl, from some of the guys on the team. Actually, I'd been hearing about her boobs, and I was underwhelmed by her face. I was also unimpressed with her hair and her clothes too. But when she put her books down and I saw those mangoes, my Johnny sprung up to salute so fast that it hurt. I made a beeline over to where she was sitting. It was weird. She was sitting off in a corner by herself. Everyone else was eating lunch or talking to their friends, but she was by herself. I sat down across from her, but she didn't even look up. Hey babe, I said. I'm not interested, she said. Huh? I gulped. I was shocked. This was after all my school. Usually my soulful, hey babe, was enough. I'm not interested in guys that call me babe, like they can't be bothered to learn my name, she said. I'm even less interested in guys who talk to my boobs. Do you know who I am? I asked. Yeah, you're on the football team, she said. I guess that means I'm supposed to just drop my drawers and bend over, huh? We should probably go somewhere more private, I said. But that's the way it works. Well, I guess it's broke, she said, because it ain't working at all. I was shocked. I couldn't believe the bitch was turning me down. I'd had cheerleaders play hard to get with me, but they were pretty. I looked around and as usual everyone was watching me. Sorry, I said as loudly as I could. I didn't know we had any lesbians in this school. Everyone around us started laughing. 
She had no idea what to say. All her smart-ass quips died in her throat. I think I do know your name after all. It's Ellen, right? I laughed. Just leave me alone, she whined. Just leave me a... Before I could finish mocking her, someone had grabbed me by my collar from behind. It was so fast that I couldn't get my bearings. The person slammed his foot into the back of my knee and pulled downwards on my collar at the same time. It must have been some kind of judo throw, because the next thing I knew I was staring upwards at a face, filled with more rage than I'd ever seen. Before I could react, a fist aided by gravity, slammed into my eye. I was kind of woozy. I heard everyone in the area ooing and yelling, fight. It wasn't much of a goddamned fight though. I was on my back and every time I tried to get up, he hit me. By the time a faculty member grabbed him, I was so loopy that I couldn't even try to cover myself, let alone raise any type of defense. They got me on my feet and marched me, still bleeding, to the principal's office. I sat there in a chair in front of her desk trying to get my wits back. I felt like I'd been run over by a truck. Everything hurt. My right eye hurt. I couldn't see out of my left eye. My nose turned out to be broken, and both of my lips were split. Holy shit. You look like hell, she said. You can go. Huh. I said. You play football, right? She asked. I nodded. This is a no-call situation, she said. It's like when your wide receiver is going up against a really good corner. They're both looking for the ball. They both push off of each other. Finally, the corner intercepts the ball. Your coach wants a pass interference call, but the ref points out that your guy was pushing off just as much. Both penalties offset each other. The interception counts. But, I said, look at my face. You're lucky to still be going to this school, let alone playing football, she said. She walked around her desk and sat down. The principal was not an impressive looking specimen. She looked like somebody's old gray haired grandmother. Your coach said you were kind of stupid, she said. So, let me explain this to you. We tolerate your antics because having a winning football team brings students to the school. Your way of slamming that empty head of yours into walls of other steroidal morons is effective. So, we put up with your habit of screwing cheerleaders too. We even lowered the standards in most of our classes to allow you to pass them. But even we have limits. Are you aware that we live in a climate of extreme tolerance? We do. I asked. There is no way I can let you get away with sexual harassment on this campus. You also called the little bitch a lesbian in front of all kinds of witnesses. So, if I do anything to them, it sends a message that I allow members of the LGBTQ community to be harassed. If it got out, I'd be replaced faster than you can slam your head into a linebacker. And the next principle might be tougher on students who can't count or read. Feel me? Yeah, I said. I just want to know who the guys that jumped me are. There were no guys, she said. It was one guy, Bryce Callahan. You're kidding me, I laughed. That guy is like half my size and as gentle as a lamb. He has a crush on that girl you were attacking, she said. So, he went after you like a bear protecting his cubs. Leave both of them alone. Stick to cheerleaders and other skanks. If anything happens to either of them, you don't graduate. Even if someone else bothers them, you don't graduate. That means you don't go to the pros because you don't get into a college. Every college I've ever seen or heard about will only take you if you've graduated from high school. You got it? Crystal, I said. She looked at me strangely. Um, the coach always ends with, is that clear? She shook her head and pointed towards the door. In the days that passed, things for me went back to normal. After a few days, everyone had forgotten about my fight. Or whatever it was against Bryce. I went after and conquered, prettier. More popular girls and pretty much forgot about Evelyn. But occasionally, I'd see her and she'd be back in my mind. I watched their entire romance taking shape. It was like a fairy tale. At first, they were so awkward together that it was almost painful to watch. As time went on, they became more and more comfortable with each other. Then, suddenly, they just blended. It was the strangest thing. It was almost like they stopped being two people and became one thing. Bryce was always an okay guy. He wasn't on the team or anything, but he was smart, and a lot of people liked him. Suddenly girls who should have been with guys on the teams were interested in him. I think it was that herd mentality thing that girls do. They saw him with Evelyn and figured if he was keeping her happy, he could make them feel the same way. And Evelyn, damn, she just blossomed. She started wearing makeup and her clothes got better. She also became more confident. You could tell by the way she walked. She had the walk of a girl who knew what she had and knew the effect it had on men. It was clear from the way they looked at each other but also from the way they touched each other and couldn't keep their hands off of each other that they were not only in love, but they were brewing up a storm. And the way they talked, they thought they were so slick. 
They had their own little codes for things. Like when a couple of the cheerleaders tried to invite him to a party over the vacation. He can't. She smirked. We have to work on that project. I was there. The way she said, project, left no doubt what she was talking about. There was another thing about her too. The first time I went after her, she'd been hiding her boobs behind her books. It was almost as if she was ashamed of them. Or she hoped no one would notice them. But once she got with Bryce, it was scary. Them titties were out in the open. It was almost like she was trying to club you over the head with them. Or she at least wanted everyone to see what Bryce was getting. And I had to admit that it got to me. I didn't want her. At least not permanently. I just wanted a sample. I wanted to see if she screwed like every other girl. Or if there really was something special about her. And there was something else. I hated to admit it. But I was kind of jealous. Evelyn had this glow about her whenever the two of them were together. As far as I knew, they were each other's first at everything. I'd had more girls than I could remember by then, but I'd never had any girl light up for me the way Evelyn did when Bryce was around, and I wanted that so badly. If just one time, I could have someone light up for me like that, I would die a happy man. So, I stalked her for about a week before I found her alone. Hey, um, Evelyn, I said as politely as I could. You want to hang out sometime? I'm with Bryce, she said. I do all of my hanging out with him. Well, if you ever want to hang out with somebody else, somebody with more experience, somebody who could rock your entire world, just let me know. It's not gonna happen, he said over my shoulder. He walked around and stood next to her. Dude, it's not that serious, I said. Yes, it is, she said, taking a hold of his arm. As soon as we graduate, we're getting married. I know you're supposed to be hot shit around here, but you will never have me. It was her mocking tone and his knowing smile that pissed me off. Yeah, I will, I told them. It'll probably take a while, but sooner or later me and her are gonna screw. I walked away before there was a fight. I heard the two of them laughing as I left. Now let's check the story from Bryce's side. Saturday mornings were my favorite days of the week. I got to do what every 24-year-old divorce guy did. I went into work. It was off the clock, but it was an investment. As the new guy, I needed to make a good impression. Every Monday, I went in and showed the team edited programs that were more efficient. I worked on a lot of our jobs on the weekend. I did most of the editing on Saturday. The plant was empty, so I didn't have to worry about slowing down production or people looking over my shoulder. Another thing that I loved was the quiet. Without the various noises of three production lines, you could almost hear a pin drop inside of the building. This morning, I wasn't even running a machine yet, which made things even more quiet. I was running one of our current production programs on the simulator. I was as usual looking for places to make the program more efficient. I scrolled through the lines of programming looking for settings and parameters that could be changed. The only sounds were the taps of my fingers on the touchscreen keyboard. But as I scanned the screen, for a second, I thought I heard music. I stopped typing and listened. I heard nothing, so I began scanning again. After a few seconds, it started again. And this time I was very sure. I assumed that maybe someone had come in to clean the office areas, or even the shop and they had music playing, or maybe the radio on. It had nothing to do with me, so I continued to work. Working was a big part of my life. Working took my mind from the mess I'd made of my life. When I worked, I had to concentrate on the programs. Missing a line or making an error could be costly. That left me no room for thinking about anything except what I was trying to do. It meant that everything about my life before that moment had to recede to the dim recesses of my consciousness. It gave me a few moments of peace without thinking about her and the way she ripped me apart. I'd been working for Velasco Products for nine months now. Evelyn had probably had her baby and was married to Vincent and happy. She'd moved on. I wish I could. But every unguarded goddamned moment I had, she was sneaking into my head. I lost my place. I had to start all over again from the beginning. No, I didn't. I could start from the second tool change. With Evelyn banned from my thoughts, I looked at the screen again and began to concentrate. But the music, louder now, wouldn't let me. I tried to compose my face. It wouldn't be good for me to go storming over to the other side of the building and angrily demand that some cleaning lady, or some college kid who was just out to earn a few bucks, turn down their goddamned music so I could work. I just needed to be polite and ask nicely. Once I got the program where I wanted it, I could transfer it to a machine and the noise from the machine would drown out the music. So, maybe I wasn't smiling, but my face no longer wore a scowl as I followed the sound of the music to its source. I had no idea that the music was coming from a boom box that was much closer to me than I'd ever imagined. It was in the next section. As I rounded the corner a body twirled past me, missing me by inches as she leaped into the air. She landed lightly and kicked a leg into the air, 
high above her head while leaning backwards so deeply that her mane of long wavy red locks dragged the floor. She stepped out of the kick and it appeared that a wave passed through her body. The ripple began at her lower legs, passed through her torso, and ended with a snap at her neck. She did another series of kicks and then lost her balance and almost fell. She laughed. Her laughter was more melodic than the music somehow. Sweat beaded on forehead and upper body. Her leotard was soaked. I guess then would have been the time to say something but, I couldn't form words. I was enraptured by golden brown skin and long beautiful red hair. Somehow the two didn't seem to go together. But they looked so good together. Her body was incredible. It seemed like a sin to compare her to Evelyn, but the value or magnitude of anything has to be compared to a known value or frame of reference. If there was no zero, what would be the difference between 1,000 and 1 million? So, comparing her to a known quality, my ex-wife, helped me wrap my mind around how incredible she was. Evelyn had huge boobs, but Evelyn was twice the size of this girl. Taking proportion into consideration changed the numbers. This girl also had a very tiny waist, and from there down, there was no comparison. Her hips were toned, yet still so much rounder and fuller than Evelyn's. Her legs were in a class by themselves, and my appraisal was halted by the sound of her voice. It was squeaky sounding and she sounded pissed. Why are you standing there perving on me? She hissed. Because I'm trying to work, and your music distracted me, I spat back at her. What are you doing here anyway? This isn't a dance studio. How did you get in here? I took a second to breathe and let it out. Look, it's okay. I won't call the cops on you. But you need to find another place to dance. This ain't footloose. You could get hurt in here. Just grab your stuff and scram. She was looking at me, and her anger melted at about the same time mine did. She looked me up and down and smiled. Then she sat down on the floor and smiled even more. As she smiled, I felt as if lightning had struck. I'm not going nowhere, she smiled. Don't you mean, anywhere? I asked. Whatever, she said. Her voice sounded as if she was playing with me. Go ahead. Call the cops, she said. I dare you. She folded her arms across her chest and smirked at me. I was flummoxed. On one hand, I really didn't want to call the police and get her arrested. But on the other, I couldn't let her stay. She didn't belong there. If she got hurt, or if she damaged some of the equipment, it could be bad. And who knew how many other kids she might let in with her the next time. I needed to find out how the hell she got in in the first place. The door only opened with an ID batch. So, either she'd stolen it, or she was related to someone who worked here. Or shit, maybe she worked here herself. Just as that thought entered my head, she spoke again. Before you call the cops, she smirked. Why the hell are you here on a beautiful Saturday morning? This place isn't open on weekends. I came in to work on something, I said. You must suck at your job, she laughed. Everybody else gets their work done in five days, and it takes you six. That's not it, I said, trying not to sound like I was whining. Then what is it? She asked. To be good at anything, you have to work hard at it, I said. If you were good enough to get hired, you're probably already pretty good, she said. Won't your skills just get better with time and experience? I need to be even better, I said. I need to pay Mr. Velasco back for the faith he showed in me. Her eyes softened. Do you work hard and scratch that, she said. I can already see that. Are you trying to be the boss or something? Is that it? You're ambitious? I laughed. What's so funny? She asked. This is a family-owned company, I said. Mr. Velasco already has two sons. They've been ready to run this place since they were kids. And their kids will run it when they're done. I just want to do my best and learn as much as I can and... And? She said, urging me on. And I really don't want to call the cops on you, I said. You seem to be so nice. Can you please just... Do you work here? Hell no, she said. They couldn't pay me enough. Well, did you borrow a badge from somebody? I asked. Nope, she smiled. You can't do it, can you? I pulled out my phone and punched in a number. What? Asked a sleepy voice. I stepped away from her to get some privacy. I'm sorry to call you sir, I said. But there's a problem. What kind of problem? He asked. Where are you anyway? Bryce, is that you? Yes, sir, I said. I'm at work, and there's... Why are you at work on a Saturday? He asked. I wanted to get in some time to work on the programs while the lines are down, so we could... Okay, Bryce. He said. I got it. What's the problem? Sir, there's somebody in the plant who doesn't work for us, I began. Bryce, don't confront them, he said. Forget about all of that stuff. Insurance will cover anything they break or steal. Just get out of there and call 911. I've already seen her and confronted her, I said. She wasn't stealing anything or damaging anything. She. Screw that. 
he said. We can't have vagrants or homeless people setting up in the place. Call the P. His voice was cut off in mid-sentence. Hi, Bryce. This is Monica, she said. What does this person look like? Good morning, ma'am, I said, turning away and keeping my voice down. It's a girl and she, she's beautiful. She has long red hair and I heard her laughing and mumbling something to her husband. Then she got back on the phone. Bryce hand the phone to the vagrant, she said. Maybe I can convince her to leave. If not, you go ahead and call the police. I turned and found that she'd followed me. She was standing right behind me smiling at me. Um, my boss, um, his wife wants to talk to you, I said. I held out my phone to her. So, I'm beautiful, huh? She smirked. Listening in on other people's conversations isn't nice, I said. She took the phone from me and immediately launched into an argument in rapid-fire Spanish. It was loud, and it was vicious sounding. I had no idea what I should do. I just stood there listening. She finally closed the conversation with, I love you too, mommy, then handed me my phone. Listening in on other people's conversations isn't nice, she smirked. My mouth dropped open. Since I'm so beautiful, can you drive me home? She asked, batting her huge green eyes at me several times. I took an Uber to get here, and my parents don't trust them. I had no words. I just watched as she gathered her things. She grabbed a pair of jeans from the floor and skinned them up her long legs. She had to jump several times to get them over her butt. Each jump sent all that hair flying around her face. Then she zipped them and closed her belt. The jeans looked like they'd been painted on. So, are we going? She smiled. Or are you still mesmerized by my beauty? Why didn't you just tell me who you were? I asked. Because it was a lot more fun this way, she smiled. And I gotta find out something too. After hearing from my brothers for all my life that I'm as ugly as sin, and contrasting that with all the idiots at school telling me that I'm hot, it was confusing. I'm not stupid enough to believe the guys at school. They just want a piece of meat. They say that same line to every girl they try to screw. My brothers, on the other hand, have been picking on me all my life. You, I really believe that you meant it. Now let's check the story from Evelyn's side. It took a while to get Alex back to sleep after Vincent left. Maybe it was because she, like I did, just felt dirty after being in his presence. I think that we both knew what that idiot had cost us. With my daughter nestled in my arms, sucking happily away on a bottle, my mind went back to before all this bullshit had begun. After high school had ended, was a defining time for me. Bryce had graduated with honors. He had the highest GPA in our school and was ranked third overall in our class. It was pure bullshit. Even the principal felt shitty saying it on the stage at our graduation. You could tell by the way she announced the winners. I swear her mouth looked like she was spitting out a turd as she explained why the guy with the highest GPA wasn't ranked first, like in every other school in the universe. In our school, grades are only one of the metrics by which we measure success, she said. We also value community service, participating in extracurricular activities and giving of oneself. Even as she said it, someone in one of the middle rows yelled, like when your super rich daddy gives the school a big check. Everyone in the audience laughed. Someone else yelled, shit, it happened twice. I heard there was a bidding war. Then it got ugly. One of the parents yelled, hey, in that case, can I just pay for my kid's diploma now, instead of her needing to go to summer school to graduate? The principal took a lot of angry comments, but finally got the crowd to come to order. While she spoke claiming that she knew nothing about how the placements were decided, her secretary was rapidly shuffling papers. I later discovered that she was putting the names of the class in alphabetical order instead of class ranking order. When she was done speaking and order had resumed, the principal then turned the microphone over to the class valedictorian for her speech. During the principal's attempts to restore order, the girl had proven her intelligence. She'd gotten out of her chair, taken the notes for her speech with her, and gone to sit in the audience. The guy in second place suddenly realized that the crowd was looking for someone to take its anger out on. So while the principal was explaining that the valedictorian was nervous about speaking in front of a large crowd, he bolted. When the principal turned around, neither of the two, top, students was still on stage. Bryce had been seated in the audience since he wasn't expected to give a speech. The principal couldn't recognize Bryce from Adam and therefore couldn't draft him to come up and speak. Without further delay, you're graduating senior class, she said without much enthusiasm. There was a very sour-looking woman at the edge of the stage, shaking her head. That was when I discovered my problem. The alphabetical order had really screwed up my plans. My plan had been to use my cousin Buffy's cap and gown to walk across the stage. It was perfect because my parents didn't have the $50 for a cap and gown. And since Buffy was number 14 out of our graduating class of 80 students, she could walk across the stage, get her diploma, 
pose for a few photos, and even talk a bit before she handed me her cap and gown so I at number 79 walked across. I had no idea what I was going to do. I got into line and the sour-looking woman stared at me as I neared the stage in my jeans and t-shirt. My cousin was right behind me in line since we had the same last name. Just as I got near the stage, I felt a tap on my shoulder. I turned to find Bryce, as usual coming to my rescue. He slipped his cap onto my head as I stepped into his gown. It was a pretty tight schedule since my last name began with C and his with E. I walked across the stage, grabbed my diploma, walked down the stairs, smiled for one photo, and ran to the other side of the stage to give Bryce his cap and gown back. Bryce was still adjusting his gown as he walked up to the principal to get his diploma. I was so proud of him. I clapped along with his parents and most of the crowd as he his diploma. He pulled me into the photos they took of him too. Just as we were about to leave the sour-looking woman came over to us. Congratulations, she said to Bryce. I saw what you two did back there. You are an outstanding young man. What college are you going to? I got accepted at three, said Bryce. I was offered a partial scholarship at one, but I was offered a job, and that's my choice. I'd like to work for a while. Always a good choice, she said. But if you ever change your mind, or you need any type of help, please call me. Your accomplishments and your compassion merit at least that. Now excuse me. I need to have a long talk with your principal about her future. She gave Bryce a business card. She was the state's secretary of education. It turned out that she was a really nice lady. That sour face had been the result of her hearing all that crap about parents paying for perks. It was a weird afternoon. I spent the entire time with Bryce and his parents. We went out to eat and just hung out at their house. His mom and dad made me feel that I had accomplished something great. I kept telling them that I had graduated almost dead damned last in our class. But you graduated, said his mom. You fulfilled all of the requirements necessary to move on to the next level. What about all of those kids who have to go to summer school to get to where you are? I smiled. You can do whatever you want from here on out, said his dad. You can get a job and go to college later, like Bryce is doing. I wish we had the money to send him to college now, though. Give it some thought, Evelyn. You'll figure it out. I'll probably get a job, I said. So, I can help out. That's a great thing, said Bryce's mom. I'm sure your parents will appreciate it. Oh, I wasn't talking about helping them, I told her. I intend to marry your son as soon as I can drag him to a church. She laughed and hugged me. I think you're a bit late, she laughed. I was shocked. What do you mean? I asked. All kinds of nasty thoughts went through my mind. She leaned over and whispered in my ear. It seemed like such a normal gesture. It was a simple showing of intimacy between two close family members. I felt warm and loved. All the things that I'd never gotten from my own mother. A tear rolled down my cheek. Evelyn, don't cry, she said. I think our wires were crossed. I think that she thought I was crying because Bryce had chosen someone else. If that had been the case, I'd have tracked the bitch down and strangled her with my bare hands. I was actually crying because... The closeness and love she had shown me was so much superior to anything I got at home. My mother's general disinterest in me and anything else outside of a bottle. Or my father's disgusting interest in me that made my skin crawl. I have no idea what was worse. He hadn't touched me or tried anything. But he was always lurking outside of my room or the bathroom when I was in there. Bryce already got you an engagement ring, she whispered. I just told you because I don't want you to worry about it. This way you'll be prepared for it so you can make sure he does it right. He gets so nervous and clumsy around you. I think it's just because he loves you so much. Don't forget to act surprised. She hugged me, and I had to fight to keep my tears away. I wanted so badly to be a part of that family. They were so kind and so nice. God must have been looking out for me the day that he sent Bryce to me. Things moved along, but not the way we'd planned. I was planning a wedding with Bryce's mom. My mom scared me with her reply to my invitation for her to help us. What do you want me for? She screamed. I never gave you permission to get married. I don't even know this boy. I ain't never seen him. So, if you get married don't bother stepping foot back in this house. Her outburst was bad. Even for her. I think that outburst even made my father realize that there was something seriously wrong with her. We just looked at each other and shook our heads. It was the first time my dad and I had agreed on something. Mom. I said after giving her some time to cool down. I'm marrying Bryce. You've met him lots of times. He's been over here constantly for the past two and a half years. You're lying, she hissed. You can't fool me. Get out of my face, liar. Bryce was at work. I called him in tears. I'll be right there, he said. And suddenly, I was smiling again. No, you won't, I said. I can handle this. You keep making money for us. 
but my good feelings weren't going to last. I went to my room. I spent some time looking at wedding dresses in a catalog. I was pretty sure that most of them were outside of my budget, but it gave me some ideas about what I wanted. My dad came into my room. That scene with your mom was kind of out there, wasn't it? He asked. She was just drunk, I said. Evelyn, I get drunk, he said. She was out of her mind. She's losing more of her memory every day. Now you see what I have to put up with. I didn't know it had gotten this bad, I said. Is there anything we can do for her? From what I understand, there's two choices, he said. We can take care of her at home, or we can put her into a facility where she'd get round the clock care. And since we don't have any money for something like that, I guess I should help out more often, I said. Well, if you really wanted to help, he began. One of the things your mother has no interest in, not forget it. No, I said. I'll do it. I was in a weird mood. It was almost like hanging from a cliff by my fingertips and trying to decide whether to just let go or try to hold on. The distance I'd fall wasn't very far, and I probably wouldn't be hurt, but getting back to where I was would be impossible. At that moment, I was hanging suspended by the tiniest grip between childhood and adulthood. Very soon I'd be marrying Bryce and starting our lives together, but at that particular moment, I was still my parents' little girl. In fact, the realization that my mom was nuts was the first time that my dad and I had shared anything in longer than I could remember. With all the things I'd done and all the time I'd been spending with Bryce and his family, it was comforting that my dad and I could try to face something together. I felt closer to him than I ever had. I felt as if we could bond and become closer over our mutual need to handle my mom's health issues. I felt closer to my dad than I ever had been before. And it felt good to see him treating me like an adult or an equal. I got the idea, from the way that he looked at me, that for the first time he needed input or something from me. He needed my opinion and my help with a problem. Baby girl, I hoped you'd say that, he said. His eyes lit up and his voice sounded funny. He wrapped one of his arms around me. It didn't give me tingles, like I got when Bryce did it, but my dad hadn't hugged me since I was seven or eight. Oh baby, he gushed and suddenly, my lack of tingles became a full-fledged shock as I felt his hands touching my boobs. What the hell is wrong with you? I screamed and jumped back away from him. Me and your mom, we don't do it anymore, he whined. And a man has his needs. That is not going to happen, ever, I said. Bullshit, he spat. It's already happening. Don't think I don't know what you and that boy have been doing. If you can do it with him, you can surely do it with your own father. Especially after the way you've been teasing me for the past couple of years. How have I been? I asked in shock. You walk around the house in those tight clothes with your titties jiggling, he gushed. What did you think would happen? You want me. You're just playing hard to get. Daddy, we aren't rich, I said. My clothes are tight because I've grown out of most of them, and I can't afford to own more than one or two bras. So if I'm just sitting around the house, I go without one. I never dreamed that you were looking at your own daughter with lust. I'm a man, he hissed. A man who ain't getting none. I know that you'll be gone in a few months. So I think that out of gratitude for me giving you life, you should be willing to give me a little something in return. Bryce ain't never gonna know. I saw what you two was up to in his car the other night. I couldn't believe you was out there in a car giving a BJ like a cheap street hooker. I almost had a heart attack when I realized that my daughter was screwing a guy. And he wasn't forcing you to do it. You wanted to do it. Your mama ain't never screwed me like that. Not even when we made you. She always acted like doing it was just something she had to put up with. But you like it. You like getting screwed and we both know it. So, giving me some every once in a while ain't gonna hurt nothing. Nobody will ever know it but you and me. It's not gonna happen, I said. So, what if I screwed Bryce? He loves me, and I love him. We are not just screwing around, Daddy. We're gonna get married. He put a ring on my finger, and we're planning the wedding. We're looking for an apartment, and we're gonna be together forever. So, if I want screw him, it's not any of your business. He lunged at me and knocked me back onto my bed. He grabbed the neckline of my ratty t-shirt and yanked with all his might. The shirt tore all the way down and exposed my cleavage. He just stood over me staring. I tried to cover myself up. I'll scream, I said. This is a trailer, a-hole. People will come when they hear me screaming. Any of the men in this park will want to do the same thing I'm about to do as soon as they get a look at you, he said. I tried to wrestle him away from me as he reached out to grab me, but he was too strong. I was disgusted. While I tried to cover myself, I tried to cover my nakedness with my hands as I squirmed away. Yeah, baby he crooned. Just relax. We'll do it just the way you like it. He never took his eyes from me. I stopped fighting and just laid there. He leaned over the bed with a big smile on his face. He dove lightly towards me as if we were playing a game. 
I waited until he was in the air suspended. Then at the height of his stupid little leap, I moved. I didn't have time to roll out from under him, and it was clear that I wasn't strong enough to fight him off. I also had time for only one short movement, so I made it. As he hung there for a fraction of a second, before gravity took a hold of him, I made my one small move. I bent my knee. He landed on that upward bent knee so hard, with all of his weight multiplied by gravity, that it almost ruptured his balls. It turned out that I was not a psychic. My prediction was almost right. I told him that I was going to scream. I told him that people would come. I was almost right. There were definitely screams. They were very loud. And they were high-pitched enough to have come from a woman. And people did come. They came out of their trailers just in time as I grabbed a long coat, my shitty old tennis shoes and my phone. I wrapped the coat around me and ran through the door of the trailer just as the first of our curious neighbors arrived. I left the door wide open. A couple of people skipped by me as I sat down on the blocks of cement we used as a porch to out my shoes on. Even my drunken mother had been roused by the screams. By the time that anyone had looked across the shitty, shabby, dark interior of the trailer to see my dad screaming, holding his nuts and writhing in pain, I was calmly walking down the road talking to Bryce. He immediately left work and came to get me. I waited for him outside of a neighborhood store. When he pulled up in that rusted old Camaro, I was never so glad to see anybody in my life. He hugged me, and I just knew that everything was going to be fine. We went to eat, and I explained everything to him. He held my hand and told me not to worry. Our schedule might have to speed up, but this was nothing we couldn't handle. Let's go get your stuff, he said. Bryce, I don't want to go back there, I said. I'm scared. I think I need to have a talk with your dad, he said. The look on Bryce's face made me afraid in a different way. We're just going to go and get your stuff, he said. You can't just walk around in a coat and nothing else. If you had your way, I wouldn't even need the coat, I laughed. He turned as red as a beet. I promise, he said. If he doesn't start any shit, there won't be any. But we need your clothes. After that you can come and live with us until the wedding. What if your parents don't want me there? I asked. Then we live at the apartment, he said. We got approved. I put the first month's rent down this morning. All we need is the security deposit and we can move in. We won't have any furniture but we'll have a roof over our heads. I hugged him. I hugged him tighter than I ever had. It's one thing for a guy to like screwing you. They all did that. It's another thing for a guy who likes screwing you to tell you that they love you. Some of them even seem to mean it. But it's the very best thing when a guy steps up to the plate and proves to you that he loves you and that he has your back on the very lowest day of your life. So, we drove back to the trailer park that I'd lived in for most of my life. I'd expected to see my dad and I expected him to be pissed. What I saw instead were several police cars and a few police officers in front of our trailer and everybody else that lived in the park, along with a bunch of people I'd never seen before, rubbernecking. Some of them had lawn chairs and were sitting there on the bumpy, uneven brownish area of sprouts and weeds that my dad had called the lawn. Those weeds were pretty vicious. They destroyed everything that tried to grow there. My mom was calmly talking to one of the officers, who seemed to be writing down every word she said. As I got out of Bryce's Camaro, she pointed at me and several officers came right over to me. Step away from the suspect, sir, one of them said to Bryce. He wrapped his arms around me even more closely and turned so he was between the officers and me. Everybody calm down, said the older officer who'd been writing down my mom's statement. That's her, screamed my mom. And look she's got another guy with her now. Maybe this one is her pimp. Thanks mom, said Bryce sarcastically. Why are you calling me mom? Asked my mother. I've never seen you before in my life. But that girl you're with, she's the 304 that attacked my husband. She should be in jail. I hate hookers. Half of the people in the crowd started laughing. I started crying and Bryce hugged me even tighter. Maybe we should go inside to discuss this, said the older cop. I think he realized that something was going on. He followed Bryce. My mom and me into the trailer and two other cops came with us. Okay, before we get into what happened this evening I have a few questions, he said. You've never seen this man before? And the woman with him is a prostitute that your husband hired, correct? Absolutely. Spat my mom. And you, young lady, he said looking at me. Is that true? Officer, can I get my wallet out? I asked. He looked at the other cops and then nodded to me. I got my wallet out and passed him my birth certificate. Look at the parents listed on it, I said. I'm 18 years old. I just graduated from high school. I'm her daughter. I've lived in this trailer with her and my dad for all of my life and look at the photos on the shelf over there. He looked and saw the pictures we'd taken over the years. There was even a recent photo of me, my mom, 
my dad and Bryce, all smiling at the camera together. There was also a photo of my mom hugging Bryce that was taken on the day I got engaged. The cops looked at the photos and then at each other. He turned to my mom. Ma'am, why did you lie to us? He spat, lying to a law enforcement. Officer, she's not really lying, I said interrupting him. My mom suffers from some sort of dementia. It was either caused by or exacerbated by alcoholism. She lives in her own little world. Did you assault the gentleman that lives here? He asked. I nodded. Why? He asked. His voice was compassionate. I think he knew something was up. I gripped Bryce's hand for support. He's my father, I said, concentrating on the feeling of Bryce's hand on mine. Until today, he didn't take much interest in me. I guess until today he never really noticed that I'm all grown up and about to get married. Today. It was hard to say it. Bryce squeezed my hand again. Today. My father tried to assault me. Young lady. Stop talking, he said. I don't want to put you through this more than once. I know that telling us what happened would be like reliving it. I want to have a female officer or two, along with the DA, there when you tell it. And we'll record it, so you don't have to go through it more than once. We're also asking you for a DNA sample. I nodded and a man in a lab coat came over and took a swab of the inside of my cheek. We ended up at the police station. They offered us coffee and snacks. Several people came, and went until finally a woman with a clipboard came in. Two other women, as well as the original police officer sat down at the table. The woman with the clipboard looked up and asked me to tell her what had happened. I told her the entire story, and she seemed to get angrier with every second. Her entire expression gave me the impression that she didn't believe me. Before I finished, the lab tech came back. She looked at him, and he shook his head. Nothing? She said. He shook his head again. She slammed the clipboard on the table. I squeezed Bryce's hand tighter. She looked as if she was angry enough to chew nails. Then another cop came in. Ma'am, there's a problem, he began. It'll have to wait, she snapped. Honey, she began. I'm telling the truth. I blurted out. I swear that's what happened. Evelyn, calm down, she said. I believed you from the beginning. I was just gonna say that you shouldn't have left the scene of the crime. And you really should have called the police. Why? I asked. I'm a girl from a trailer park. I was scared, and I didn't know what to do. I've never been in any kind of trouble, but the only thing I've ever seen the police do is drive into the park and take somebody away. And they always look down on us, like we're dirty or something. So, you went and found your boyfriend? She asked. Nope. I smirked. I called him, and he left work and came and got me. Coming back here was his idea. I just wanted to leave. So, what happens now? Asked Bryce. She made a face and screwed up her mouth like she was about to tell us something bad. The officers who were first on the scene responded to a call made by one of your neighbors, she said. Their response was probably framed by the call. You have to remember your neighbor had no idea what had happened. So, the call they got was that one of their neighbors, a man had been attacked and was screaming like a banshee. The officers had to force the door to the trailer open and found your father lying on his side, holding onto his genitals and screaming in pain. The pain was so intense, according to their reports that he was vibrating. They called an ambulance. The emergency med techs gave him a very strong four painkiller. Once the pain was lessened, the officers began to question him as the med techs examined him. From what the med techs said, his nuts were swollen almost as big as baseballs. The police officers got a statement from him. His story was completely different from what you told us. And you believed him. I yelled. Tears were running down my cheeks and I held onto Bryce's hand like I was underwater, and it was my airline. Until you showed up, we had no other opinions on what had happened she said. The investigators on the scene did a very thorough study of the scene and all of the evidence on hand. They took photographs of everything and collected several pieces of evidence, some of what really conflicted with what your father claimed. But until you got there, and until you told us your side of it, it never made sense. Our plan was to wait a few hours until your dad had recovered enough to answer a few questions and then go from there. What did he say happened? Asked Bryce. He said that he'd been arguing with you, his daughter, I'm only pointing that out because your mother had a different version. Anyway, your father claimed that he'd been arguing with you over money. He said he'd just gotten his paycheck and had promised you money that he couldn't give you because Bryce and I burst out laughing. We laughed so hard we almost fell onto the floor together. May I finish? She asked. Bryce and I got back into a seated position while wiping the tears from our eyes. Anyway, he said he couldn't give you the money because the bills were just too high that month and he, she looked at us, Please don't start laughing again. The bills were too high, and he couldn't spare the money. You became very angry, 
and kneed him in the balls and then ran out of the trailer. So, I ran out of the trailer naked except for my coat and tennis shoes? I asked. One of your neighbors did see you pulling the coat on and putting your shoes on your bare feet, she said. He also claimed that you were crying and running towards the road. It didn't seem to fit with his version. Your mother claimed that you were a prostitute that her husband had brought home. She said that you two argued over the price and he made you leave. Um, then why was he screaming if he made me leave? I asked. Her exact words were that he always screams when he don't get no sex. We later realized that your mother is, uh, not in her right mind. And, um, a few moments ago, that officer who came in here told me that your father, taking an ice pack with him, had climbed out of the bathroom window of his hospital room. We have almost half of the department looking for him. Now what was so funny? My father has never had a job in his life, let alone a paycheck, I said. Our only source of income is the money I make as a waitress and my mom's disability checks. When you catch him, if you catch him, ask him to see a check stub. Ask him to see any check stub from any paycheck in the last 18 years. The police did eventually find him, but it took them almost three weeks for him to slip up. He tried to sneak back into the trailer, thinking that they were no longer looking for him. And they took him in without any difficulty. He claimed it was all a misunderstanding. He was sure that if given the chance to speak to me, he could clear it all up. He got his chance. I spoke to him with two-inch, bulletproof glass separating us. Evelyn, you gotta convince them cops to let me go, he said. I ain't been a good father, and that day I was as drunk as a skunk and... You were sober enough to make up a story to put the blame on me for what you tried to do, I said. It was all I could think of at the time, he said. So, you're so low, that you'd let your own daughter go to jail after you tried to assault me? I asked. Evelyn, it wasn't my finest moment, he said. Why? I asked. I'm your daughter. Your flesh and blood daughter. You're not a child anymore, he said. When I went into your room and saw you in that tight t-shirt, I lost my mind. Your mom and me? We don't. I just wanted some. I wasn't going to hurt you. I thought you might have liked it. And anyway, you owe me. We've been putting a roof over your head for 18 goddamned years, so you giving something back a few times wasn't going to hurt you none. For the last two years, I've been giving you half of my paycheck, I hissed, while you sat around on your but doing nothing except drinking and running around behind mom's back with every bitch in the park that you could throw a leg over. I already told you it wasn't my finest moment, he spat, and none of them women have half of what you got. Anyway, I'm still your father. So you go tell them cops to let me out. You ain't got no choice. If I go to jail, who's gonna watch over your mother so you can hang out with that boy or go to your fancy waitress job? Is that enough? I asked. All right, bitch, he spat. I shouldn't have tried to screw you. Is that what you wanted to hear? I'm really sorry. I'm a piece of shit. I wasn't actually talking to you, I said. I was talking to the cops and he got really scared. They can't listen in on private conversations, he said. That's illegal. Not if they have permission, I said, which I gave them. You stupid 304. He screamed. If I go to jail, I'll kill you when I get out. And as of now, you're homeless. That trailer is in my name, and I don't want you there. Okay, I said. That means that when they deliver your trophy for Father of the Year, there won't be anyone there to sign for it for you. But seriously, Bryce and I moved into our apartment a week after you ran out. I wouldn't move back into that trailer if you paid me, which you can't because you don't have a job. I got up to leave and blew him a big kiss. Just as the door on his side opened and two huge guards approached him, I paused. Daddy, you should hope for a long sentence, I said. In a couple of days, they're gonna move mom into a memory care facility. And since the state is paying for it, she won't get any more disability checks for you to drink your way through. When you get out, you won't have a trailer either. That was when my father threw himself against the bulletproof glass in an attempt to get to me. But it was all for nothing. There was no way that 170 pounds of worthless drunk could get through that glass. The next time I saw him was in court. He had a huge smirk on his face. The case his lawyer tried to make was that my dad should get off with no jail time. He claimed it was all a huge misunderstanding. He claimed that my father was under the impression that I was having sex with a huge number of men and had just wanted to get on the bandwagon. He countercharged me with assault and the loss of his ability to produce offspring due to the damage I'd caused to his testicles. In other words, it was a wash. Everyone in the courtroom started laughing. Counselor, where the hell did you go to law school? Asked the judge. I'm sorry, he laughed. Wherever it was, you should ask them for your money back. That is the worst defense I've ever heard. You honor, he began. Your client admitted to attempted assault, said the judge. He also threatened to kill his own daughter in front of law enforcement officers. 
The damage to his equipment was done in self-defense. He should be glad that his daughter took out his knots. If he'd gone through with the assault, I'd have put him away for 50 years without parole. And the entire world is glad that he can no longer produce children. Especially since he's been a terrible father to the only child he has. Case closed. Court will reconvene Monday morning for sentencing. Bryce and I got married right on schedule. Our wedding wasn't lavish, but it was special and everyone there had a great time. His parents sent us on a cruise for our honeymoon. We got back and settled down to have a great life. Bryce was working in a factory just outside of town. We had our UPS and even more UPS. We never seemed to have any downtime. Bryce and I became friends with another couple that had gone to high school with us and lived in our same building. They both worked in the factory with Bryce. Becky worked as a secretary and her husband Sam worked on the line with Bryce. We spent a lot of time with them. It was Becky who told me everything that went in out at the plant. It was Becky who told us that Vincent was back in town and had just gotten hired at the plant. It took a few months before we ran into him, while out on one of our double dates. The look on his face when he saw me told me everything I needed to know. He was still the same old Vincent. He still thought he had the world on a string. He still had the same line of bullshit. He was just older and more pathetic. Hey Vincent, why aren't you away at college? I asked him. College wasn't for me. He told my boobs. Too many rules, too many dumb things to do. I thought you only want to play football, said Sam. They don't really know how to play, he said. To them it's all about the system. Everything is scripted. Their system doesn't allow for improvisation or creativity. If you don't run the correct route, you're toast. If I wanted to follow a script, I'd have been a goddamn drama student. In other words, you couldn't memorize the playbook, so you didn't get to play. And since you were there on a scholarship, not playing got you kicked out of school, right? Asked Sam. I could have learned the plays, spat Vincent, but they were dumb plays. I saw a couple of your games on TV, said Sam again. What you used to do in high school didn't work, did it? What are you talking about? Asked Vincent. You know, the way you used to just slam yourself into the line. And since you were twice as big as those high school players, you were able to break through. But when you tried it in college, where every guy there was your size or bigger, you just bounced off the line for negative yardage and then got tackled. That isn't true, said Vincent. Let me ask you a question, said Sam. Your end goal, your dream, was to play in the NFL, right? It used to be, said Emo. But all of that shit about recussions has made me rethink it. You mean concussions? Asked Sam. Recussion? Concussion? Whatever? Said Vincent. Sam burst out laughing. What's so funny? Grumbled Vincent. Why not play football in college? Get into the NFL and play for one season? Asked Sam. Even the league minimum rookie contract would give you more money than you'll make in a lifetime of working in the factory. Vincent, you've been playing football for your entire goddamned life. It was the only thing you were good at and you know it. Why quit when you were so close to your dream? You gave up all those hot cheerleaders, all that adulation, and all the fame to do what? To clean up messes in a small town factory? It sounds like you already have a concussion, if you expect any of us to believe you. Just admit it. You weren't smart enough, and you weren't good enough. So just admit it. At least you gave it your best shot, and you came a hell of a lot closer than any of us did. But expecting us to believe this bullshit story of yours is ridiculous. And for the record, my eyes are still up here. I threw in just as Sam started laughing again. Vincent had stormed off angrily. It took me a while to realize that the entire time that Vincent had been speaking to Sam, Bryce hadn't said a word. The entire time he'd been on edge and I realized that Bryce had been mentally preparing himself to go to battle with Vincent again, if necessary. I realized that he hadn't forgotten Vincent's ridiculous promise that he and I would have sex. Bryce was always trying to protect me no matter what. I wasn't used to being loved like that. I tried my goddamnedest to give it back. I swore that no one would ever separate us, for any reason, and I really meant it. So, there we were ticking along like a well-oiled machine, until we hit a run of bad luck. In quick succession, my mom died, and I lost my job. They were actually connected. My mom had been slowly dying in front of me from her dementia. I knew it was coming, but it still had a very bad effect on me. I don't think anyone gets over the death of a parent overnight. It took me weeks to come to terms with it, only to find that my boss at the restaurant had replaced me while I was gone. I looked for another job, but I really had no skills to speak of. That only served to make me even more depressed. It took months before I was ready to really get back on my feet and resume looking for a job. And through it all, Bryce never complained. He just supported us both and still found the time to do everything he could to cheer me up. He worked a lot of overtime and extra days and never complained. 
It became normal for him to get home at 9 or 10 instead of 5 or 6. And somewhere along the way, I began to suspect that Bryce was keeping a secret from me. I asked Sam if he knew anything about it, and it was clear that he didn't. Becky, on the other hand, hit her face several times during the conversation. Over the next several weeks, my mind went wild. It was next to impossible for me to concentrate on finding work or trying to take care of our house. I began to suspect that there was something going on between Bryce and Becky. We began to argue and our relationship seemed to be falling apart. I knew that he was keeping something from me. I don't know why I didn't just come out and ask him or just tell him that I was worried about our marriage. Maybe it was because of the environment I'd grown up in. Maybe my parents' screwed up relationship had me believing that somehow our would inevitably fail as theirs had. I'd been betrayed by my father, my mother, and almost everyone I'd come in contact with. So why shouldn't Bryce betray me too? But I was tired of just taking it. So I decided that for once, I was going to strike back. I knew just how to hurt Bryce. If he could play around with Becky, I could do the same. The difference was, that Bryce was screwing Becky because he'd wanted to. Or probably because he needed to while I was going through the dark days of my depression. If he'd loved me as much as he claimed he did, he would have waited for me to get over it. With my anger off of the charts, I plotted my revenge. It was a little over the top, but I was sure that once we talked and Bryce found out what I'd done and why, we could sit down and discuss what we'd both done and why. Then we could figure out where we went from there. I didn't want a divorce. I would die before I'd let him go. But he had to realize that unlike my mother, I wouldn't just roll over and live with a cheating husband. I left Bryce all kinds of clues about what I was doing. I was almost as obvious about it as he was. I'd put up with months of him coming home three or four hours late several times a week. Shit, he was screwing Becky more than he was screwing me. He was so into what he was doing that he didn't notice what I'd done. I decided to just come out and tell him. I had to. I wasn't like him. I didn't enjoy cheating. I just needed to rub his face in it to make him stop. The funny thing was that he just abruptly stopped. Even funnier was the fact that the very day that I'd done it for the second time, he came home only an hour late instead of three hours late, and he was smiling. He started kissing me, and I realized that he wanted to have sex with me. I pushed him off because I just had sex. Some part of me suddenly realized that there was something weird going on. I began to rethink my decision to tell him. Maybe I could just give him this one. After all, I'd been depressed and withdrawn and hadn't been much of a wife to him. And that was what had started all our problems. I decided to just try to go back to what we had. He seemed to be willing. So, I would try to. That Saturday evening, Bryce took me out to a very fancy restaurant. It was a celebration of some kind. Becky and Sam were there too. I had no idea why Bryce would invite them. It just seemed weird that he'd want to invite the woman he'd been screwing and her husband to our makeup dinner. I'd been giving Bryce hints all day long about what we were going to do after we got home. So, bringing Becky and Sam along just seemed weird. What also seemed weird was the fact that both Sam and Becky seemed to be both depressed and happy for Bryce at the same time. It was too weird. I guess this will be the last time we get together. At least for the near future, said Sam. God, I wish I'd done it with you Bryce, you a hole. I couldn't figure him out. He seemed to be happy that my husband had been screwing his wife. He actually wished that he'd joined in and done it with him. That's your fault, baby, said Becky. I begged you to do it. I was becoming angrier as time passed. I got up and pretended to go to the ladies' room. While I was there, I called Vincent. He told me he could be there in 10 minutes. When I got back to the table, the waitress was ready to take our orders. Bryce ordered for me and reached under the table to take my hand. From the way he looked at me, I suddenly realized that I had screwed up and badly. His eyes told me the whole story. As usual, there was nothing in his eyes except love. There were no evil intentions, but he was dying to tell me something. I decided to go back in the ladies' room to call Vincent off, but I was too late. Before I could say anything, Vincent showed up at our table. An over six-foot guy wearing grubby clothes sticks out like a sore thumb in an upscale restaurant. So almost every eye in the place was on him as he sauntered over to our table. He had a look on his face like the cat that ate the canary. I told you I'd get her, he smirked to Bryce. She ain't any different from the rest of them. And she came to me, buddy. Have you been slamming your head into something again? Asked Sam. Has that concussion finally destroyed the few active brain cells you have left? Bryce knew exactly what Vincent was talking about. It was as if it had been his greatest fear. You liar. He yelled. Vincent pulled out a cell phone and dropped it on the table in front of Bryce. He pushed play and a video started. Bryce's eyes were locked on the screen. I realized in horror that Vincent had recorded video of us. There was no denying that Vincent had told the truth. I was there in living color having sex. 
the camera shifted, or the video had been edited to show only a few moments of several different scenes. In each scene we were having sex in a different position. Vincent laughed loudly and reached out to pat Bryce on the head, as if he was a puppy. It was his last conscious movement. Bryce grabbed his hand and bent all four of Vincent's fingers back until we all heard a sickening crack. Vincent screamed like a woman being tortured, but Bryce didn't care. He let go of Vincent's hand and punched him in the face so hard that Vincent's head snapped back, and he fell over onto the floor. He was out his before his body touched down on the carpet. Bryce had reared back to kick the unconscious man in the head, but Sam probably saved both Vincent's life and Bryce's freedom by pulling Bryce away, so the kick never landed. With tears running down his face Bryce, just ran out of the restaurant and never looked back. I was too shocked to do anything. Every eye in the place was on us. We just sat there in stunned silence. After a few moments, most of the diners went back to their own conversations. Evelyn, why? Asked Sam. You ought to know, I spat. And now he knows what it feels like. He knows what it feels like to what? Asked Sam. To be cheated on, I spat. Evelyn, did you see his face? Asked Sam. Did you see how hurt he was? That guy has never cheated on you. I'd bet my life on that. Me too, said Becky. Who's he supposed to be cheating with? You, I said. Did you think I didn't notice all of the little jokes you guys were making? Like I was too stupid to figure it out. Exactly what are you talking about? Asked Sam. For months now, Bryce has been getting home late several days a week and our love life ain't what it used to be. I asked you guys what was going on. Sam, you didn't seem to know anything about it and Becky just gave me veiled smirks like it was a big damn secret. Sam just shook his head. You poor, deluded bitch, he said sadly. That man loved you with all of his heart. You just threw your marriage away for nothing. I suddenly felt as if the walls were closing in on me. You guys were acting weird all night. It was like you all were happy and sad at the same time. And you guys have some kind of secret. Evelyn, we do, he said sadly. But it was a good secret. Well, good for you guys. Not so good for us. Not that bad, said Evelyn. But it could have been better if Mr. Lazy, bum over there had done what Bryce did. Can someone just explain all of this? I said. I'm tired of all of the secrets. Can someone call me an ambulance? Groaned Vincent. You're an ambulance, I spat. Now shut up. As you know, Becky works in the office, began Sam. And about a year ago, she started running across a lot of papers that made her believe the plant would be sold. What does that have to do with anything? I said. The plant's been sold five times in the last ten years, and it's never. Do you want to know or not? Hissed Sam. Anyway, like you said, the plant changes hands a lot, but this time it was different. The new owners were also ordering a lot of new machinery, but it's not like anything in the plant. They're ordering those computer machines and robots. That's a good thing, I said. If they're investing money in the place, they're not going to shut it down. That gives you guys job CCU. I began. If you interrupt me again, we're done, he said. I nodded. I was getting the impression that Sam was really pissed at me. I was torn between running after my husband and listening to Sam's explanation. I don't think you understood what I was telling you, continued Sam. They were ordering machines that could make all of our parts and products at a higher rate, with fewer errors and a lot fewer people. Becky copied everything that came across her desk and showed it to us. We currently had 450 people working at the plan over two shifts. The final plan called for two shifts of 30 people. Two or three times a year we had a changeover to set up the machines to run different parts. It usually took five days, so the company gave us the time off with pay if you used your vacation days. That meant that we sometimes got three weeks paid vacation time. From what they estimate with the new machines and robots, it would take only hours to switch between parts. Do you understand what I'm saying? None of us knew anything about operating those types of machines. It meant that almost everyone in the plant was about to lose their jobs. Most of the older guys thought about it like you are. They thought that since they'd been there forever, they were safe. They went around checking on the seniority list to make sure they were in the top 20 or 30. They smiled at guys like Bryce and me who'd only been there a few years. Other guys figured the older guys who were making more money would be the ones replaced. They figured that the company would want to invest in training smarter guys who could learn the newer systems more quickly and more easily adapt to changes. That theory scared the shit out of the older guys. They started complaining about how unfair it was. Bryce, on the other hand, had a different idea. I think he was more worried than all of us because, well, you just lost both your mom and your job, and you were kind of in a funk. So, he didn't want you to worry. I held up my hand and waved it. What? He said. So, Bryce started working all of that over time to impress the new owners. So he'd be one of the guys who kept his job, right? I asked. I was beginning to feel really shitty. 
wrong, he said. It's even worse than that. Bryce realized that. Well, maybe he thought that the new owners would come in and fire everyone. You know that old saw about how a new broom sweeps clean. At the very least, he thought that everyone would have to fill out an application and interview for a job all over again. Some of the old timers pointed out that the mayor and the city council would do something about it. Maybe they'd offer the new owner a tax break or other perks in exchange for keeping roughly 10% of the town employed directly and another 20% employed indirectly. It's been done several times before over the past 10 years, so again, nobody really worried too much about it. We passed theories around, but there had been no official announcement. For the majority of us, it was business as usual. Then why has my husband been sneaking around and keeping odd hours? If he's not cheating with Beck, I immediately clamped my lips shut. For a second, I thought that Sam was going to hit me. He did it for you, dumbass, hissed Becky. She looked at me as if I was a turd that had been dropped in the punch bowl at her wedding. He did what? I asked. He went back to school, she spat. He called that old sour woman he met at our graduation. She was able to get him some kind of hardship scholarship at that community college in Lansing. They have an accelerated program in advanced manufacturing. You go to school year-round, and it allows you to get enough credits for your associate's degree in a year. That's what tonight was all about. Bryce passed. Yesterday was his last day of finals. He called in sick at work and took his last two exams. His graduation ceremony is tomorrow, and this time it was done fairly. Bryce is the number one ranked student in his class. He'll be making a speech at the ceremony. Tears filled my eyes. I was relieved that Bryce hadn't cheated on me, but at the same time I was disgusted by what I'd done. So, all this time he was. I began, busting his butt, working as hard as he could at the plant to keep a roof over your head and food on the table, and then dragging his butt to school too, she said, looking at me as if I was the lowest form of life on earth. But I didn't know, I said. Why didn't he say something? He kept telling us that you were already overloaded, she said. You had to get over your mom passing. You had to deal with losing your job and your difficulty finding another one. He also told us that he wasn't sure that you even realized it, but losing your mom made the sting of what happened with your dad even worse, since he's your only living blood relative. He figured that as the husband, it was his responsibility to keep the bills paid and take care of you. And this is something he's wanted to do anyway. Even if the plant doesn't close, he's got a degree in an in-demand field. So, he can go out and get a better job with higher pay and better benefits. He kept saying stupid things like, Evelyn deserves better, or now we'll be able to buy a house, so our kids don't have to grow up without a backyard or rooms of their own. Suddenly I had a headache. I just wanted to curl up in a little ball and go to sleep. I wanted to wake up and find out that all of this had just been a dream. His timing was perfect, said Sam. Just like yours. What do you mean? I asked. We got a notice along with our paychecks today, he said. On Monday, both shifts are to report to the plant for a special meeting with the new owners. Evelyn found out ahead of time what's going on. Monday is the day we all get fired. They're going to give us our last checks. The managers will get their severance packages. Some of the employees will receive bonus checks for hard work, and a few of us will get job applications for positions in the new company. Here's the funny part. Apparently while the new owners were being given a tour of the plant, they noticed two or three people who impressed them enough that they're going to be asked to stay on. Bryce was one of them. That a-hole always lands on his feet. His luck never seems to run out. Luck bullshit, said Evelyn. It's not luck. You had the same chance to drag your butt to school with him. If you had, we wouldn't be moving to Iowa to work for my dad. So, sue me, he smirked. It just seemed like a lot of work for nothing. I hate school. And anyway, I don't need much to be happy. I can only think of one thing that I couldn't live without, and it's already paid for. Yeah, I know, she said. Your big TV. You almost got it, he said. What is it then? She asked, with a puzzled look on her face. Your big butt, he smirked. Then he leaned over and kissed her. Baby, you're the greatest. As long as we're together, it doesn't matter where we are. I can even put up with the fact that your dad hates my guts. Tears ran down her cheeks. But unlike mine, her were tears of joy. Sometime during out talk, Vincent had gotten himself up onto his feet. Is all of that shit true? He asked. We're all gonna be fired? We'll take you home, Evelyn, said Becky. I guess you guys have a lot of talking to do. Usually when something came up, where I had no idea what to do, I always spoke to Bryce's mom about it. I couldn't do that this time. I didn't want her to hate me. Even though my mom had passed, I had a far better relationship with Bryce's mom. I could confide in her, and she kept my secrets. As I thought about that, I reconsidered how hard I'd taken my mom's death. It made no sense for it to affect me as badly as it did. 
I'd never been able to talk to her about anything. My mom and I were never close. Now let's check the story from Carmen's side. My mom and I have always been close. I think she knew, long before I told her. Carmen Velasco, get your lazy butt out of that bed, she laughed. Her exaggerated Spanish accent belied the fact that she spoke perfect English. My mother was a second-generation Mexican-American and, like me, had been born here. She's never even been to Mexico, but her he Carmen is important to her. I was up dancing all night, I grumbled. I'm tired. Why are you dancing on your Christmas break anyway? She asked. I thought you needed time to let your niggling little injuries heal. And anyway, now that Christmas has passed, we need to start getting everything ready for the big holiday party at the plant. I need your help. Your brothers are good at going to pick stuff up, but that's about it. I got out of bed and stood up gingerly. I took a step and almost fell. My mom was on me instantly. What's wrong with you? She asked. Mom, I'm a dancer, I said proudly. We get all kinds of injuries, just like athletes. Yesterday I kind of landed funny. I think I sprained my knee. I'll wrap it up and put an ice pack on it. Honey, you know I love you. More than anything on earth, right? She asked. I smiled and nodded. Don't you think it's time you gave the dancing up? Your father, she began. Daddy just wants me to stay home and work in the office with him, I said. This is a family business. Your family business, I said in a good impression of my father's deep voice. But he already gave me the check for my tuition. So, this weekend, I'll be flying back to school. I can handle daddy. She smiled at me. I'd always had my father wrapped around my little finger. Suddenly her face changed. You're not staying for the party? She asked. There's no reason for me to watch daddy give out awards and have his employees suck up to him and then come back to our table and start lecturing me about how. Someday, this will belong to you and my grandchildren. I said mimicking my father's voice again. Well that's a shame she said. I just thought. Her voice trailed off. My mother and I have always been close. So, I knew that she was about to pull a rabbit out of her butt. You just thought what, mom? I asked. I just thought that with Bryce coming to the party, she said. And in an instant my eyes shifted, and I was on my guard. Why would that make any difference to me? I asked. It probably doesn't, she said, nodded Brycetly. But I just thought that for the past few weeks, you know? No, mom I don't know, I said. Carmen, you've been pumping your dad, your brothers, and even me for information on the guy. You've also been to the plant three or four times a week, when you normally avoid the place like the plague and… and what? I asked. And baby I know you, she said cautiously. Every time we've passed by him or caught a glimpse of him, you lit up like a string of Christmas lights. And that is not like you. I've never seen you like that before. You had us walk completely around the shop floor to get to the parking lot door when it was only 50 feet away from where we were standing. And when we passed the machine he was making some kind of adjustment on, you were swinging your butt from side to side like, like what? I asked. She grabbed me and hugged me. Like I did when I was trying to get your father to notice me, she said. It doesn't matter anyway, I told her. He avoids me like I had cooties or something. It's not you, baby, she smiled. It's everybody. Mom. You do know that he didn't even show up to the Christmas party, right? I told her. Do you know where he was? Do you? She asked me. She looked at me strangely. I just wanted to wish him a Merry Christmas. And Daddy wanted me to drop off his Christmas bonus check since he didn't show up to the party. I was supposed to just slip it under the door of his crappy apartment. I decided to hand it to him personally. Anyway, I knocked on the door and no one answered. The old lady who lives next door to him told me that he'd left bright and early that morning. She told me if I was ever looking for him, to just find his Camaro, because it was like his American Express card. He never leaves home without it. Mom, I was happy for him. I figured that maybe he'd gone out to celebrate with friends, or gone to visit his family. So, I slipped the check under the door and went back to the hall we'd rented for the party. On the way there, I passed the plant. And just for a laugh, I drove around it to the parking lot. It was there, Mom. His car. That black Camaro was right there in the lot. It was pathetic, Mom. He was there, all alone, cleaning a machine. What the hell is wrong with him that he'd rather spend his Christmas all alone, eating McDonald's instead of coming to our party? I was suddenly in tears. It was so sad, Mom. I was gonna sneak up and scare the shit out of him, like he did me when I was dancing in the plant that Saturday. I called his name, but he was wearing earbuds, so he didn't hear me. And maybe that was a good thing because just as I got close enough to really see his face, I noticed that there were tears streaming down his face. I have never seen anyone so sad in my life. It ripped my heart in two, mom. I haven't been back to the plant since then. It's too damned painful. 
there's something wrong with him. Oh, honey, she said. I should have told you this from the day you met him. Bryce is probably the nicest, most polite young man I've ever met. He's actually a lot nicer than those stuck-up little rich boys that you keep bringing home. But if you really like him, it's gonna take some work. I looked at her intently. He's on the run from the cops? I asked. He's got five or six kids and his baby's mamas are trying to track him down. I asked. She just laughed. You've been watching too much Maury, she laughed. Actually, I shouldn't tell you this, because I promised I wouldn't. He told you? I asked. How come he didn't tell me? How many times have you spoken to him? She asked. Okay, just that one time, I said. How'd you get him to tell you? He didn't. She smiled. I caught him in the plant like you did. I intended to go over and thank him for working so hard for us and tell him to take him home. My second thought was that I'd bring him home for dinner. But just like you did I caught him crying. I had to know what was going on, especially since I knew you liked him. So, I looked in his employment file. His emergency contact number turned out to be his mother. So, I called her. She's a very nice woman, and she worries about him too. She told me the whole story and swore me to secrecy. So, I'm expecting the same from you. Baby, Bryce is in a really fragile emotional state. I have no idea what you're doing up there at school, but remember how you were when you were at home? Remember how your phone never stopped ringing and you were dating a different guy every week? Bryce is dating guys? I asked. He's gay and trying to come to terms with it? What do you know about gay guys? She asked. Mom, I'm a dancer, I told her. Most of those male dancers are. No, he's not gay, she said, shaking her head. But he's not like you either. He, he can't dance? I hissed. I can teach him. Mama, anyone can? I stopped talking. Being popular and dating a lot of guys made you stronger, she said. You can break up with a guy and move on without a lot of downtime. Bryce has only dated one girl his whole life. He met her in high school, fell in love with her, and married her. He was apparently working to support her and going to school at the same time and found out that she cheated on him with some failed football player. My mouth dropped open in surprise. He filed for a divorce and left town to get a fresh start, she said. When you love somebody that much and they do something like that, it just rips your heart out. It's gonna take time and a lot of work too. Mom, I've got this, I said. Normally when I wanted something I went right after it. I'd hesitated with Bryce because seeing his pain had affected me. Truthfully, Christmas had scared the shit out of me. I'd had relatives die and been less affected by it than I'd been by seeing the pain Bryce was going through. And knowing the reason for it changed everything. I'd been extremely attracted to him during our first meeting. That was the reason I'd strung him along instead of just telling him who I was. But now that I knew more, Mr. Bryce Callahan was in for it. Now let's check Evelyn's side of the story. Three days late. My rent was due the next day and I'd already gone through my alimony. I picked up my phone and dialed a number. Hey Eve, he said. Don't you Eve me, I shrieked. Get over here with my check or the cops will be coming to get you, a hole. It's gonna take them a while to get here since I'm in Florida. Shit, I didn't mean that. I'm not in Florida. I'm in, um, North Korea. But I swear to you that the check is in the mail. Uh, gotta go Evelyn. My buddy Kim Jong wants me to um watch his soldier's goose stepping or something. Bye. I was truly screwed. I put the phone down and called a number I knew only too well. Meredith, I'm in trouble, I said. I'm pretty sure Vincent has left the state. I've been looking over your file and I may have a couple of long-term solutions, she said. She outlined a couple of possibilities, both of which I was interested in, but neither would help me in a hurry. She started the wheels turning. She already had all of Vincent's information including his social security number and everything else she needed. So, wherever Vincent went inside of the country, if he was paying taxes, my child support would be deducted from his check. No more Mr. Nice Girl. I could no longer count on Vincent doing the responsible thing. I should have known the a-hole would skip out on me. And truthfully, I was glad. I didn't miss Vincent at all. All I missed was his money. I didn't want Vincent around, constantly reminding me of the biggest, dumbest thing I had ever done. My life had been perfect. It was going exactly the way we'd planned. It just took one bad decision by me to throw the train of happiness completely off the track. I wish so badly that Bryce had gone to the counseling that my lawyer had begged for. What happened between us was just as much Bryce's fault as it was mine. The counselor had explained it to me. She told me that Bryce hadn't told me the truth. He had left out pertinent information concerning our marriage. He discovered that he might be losing his job, which affected both of us. And instead of confiding in me and forcing me to become a part of the decision-making process, which might have helped to bring me out of my depression, he decided to go it alone. 
instead of letting me in, he'd shut me out. She told me it was a very male way of handling a problem. He just found something that wasn't working and tried to fix it. The problem was that we were not communicating during that process. The lack of communication on his part forced me to jump to a conclusion. And based on my home life and extremely dysfunctional family situation, I had reacted. My reaction was to try to punish the person who'd betrayed me in kind. If Bryce was screwing around on me, I'd intended to give him back what I was getting. That was the reason I'd allowed Vincent to record what we'd done on his phone's video camera. That was also the reason I'd done all of those disgusting things with Vincent. But when I saw myself on that tiny screen, I was shocked. I realized that I had gone way too far. I couldn't believe I'd let Vincent screw me. But the biggest mistake was that I forgot about the condoms I'd bought just for that occasion. Bryce and I never used them. And since my husband had been the only man I was sleeping with, I wasn't on the pill. Shit. We'd both planned on having a house full of kids. When I first saw that tape, I'd been filled with revulsion. The only thing more important to me than vomiting the contents of my intestinal tract was trying to explain it to Bryce. But before I could come up with the words, he was gone. He left me, standing there with Sam and Becky, who just explained to me the reason that Bryce had been gone all the time. I guess I should have known all along that he would never have cheated on me, but my anger at what I thought he was doing overshadowed what was really going on. For most of my life, I've always been on edge. I've always been stuck and waiting for the next betrayal. My father's betrayal hadn't been that big of a surprise. My mother had no choice in hers. Her alcohol and depression had been eating away at her mind for a long time. Somehow, I felt as if Bryce was betraying me too. Finding out that he hadn't, and that as usual he was only to do his very best to protect me, and to take care of me made me realize exactly how badly I'd screwed up and how badly I'd hurt him. The worst thing was that I never got the chance to tell him. After he left the restaurant, we never spoke. His dad and a couple of his friends came by our apartment to get his things. The divorce was handled completely by his lawyer. It felt as if I'd been caught in a whirlwind. Everything was happening too fast for me to get my bearings or get my feet under me. Before I realized or came to terms with what I'd done, it was over and Bryce was gone. He'd accepted a job out of state. I guess his new career was as in demand as he'd claimed. It took a few days for me to realize that my marriage was over and my life would never be the same. People that I knew looked at me strangely. Sam and Becky moved away and a lot of the people we'd known had no sympathy for me. Suddenly, I was alone. It was odd. There were people all around me, but I was the loneliest person I knew. I couldn't fathom how one person leaving my life could make that big a difference. I constantly felt as if I couldn't breathe. In desperation, I went to visit his parents. They were as kind to me as they'd ever been. They didn't treat me badly or point out the obvious. I think they realized that except for Bryce himself, I was the one who lost the most. I asked his mom to put me in contact with Bryce. She shook her head and told me she'd do anything she could to help me. Except that. Evelyn, I can't do that, she said. Bryce needs some time to himself. What happened to you guys shook him to his core. He had to get away from here for a fresh start. Anything else you need I can help you with though. A few days later, I'm not sure if it was habit or desperation. I did something as natural to me as breathing. I woke and before my conscious brain even realized what I was doing, I did it. In retrospect, it was amazing that I hadn't done it sooner. I simply picked up my phone and called him. As soon as I realized what I'd done it was too late. I chuckled, but just before I hung up, he answered. Hello, he said. His voice sounded as if he'd been through hell. Bryce. I screamed. You have no idea how glad I am to hear your voice. I guess I should have changed my number, he said. I have to go, Evelyn. Goodbye. Somehow, just hearing him changed everything. I heard it all. It wasn't just his words. It was his tone, his breathing, and all the little pauses and inflections he'd used. He missed me. He was hurting as badly as I was. I had a feeling that he didn't want to be away from me any more than I wanted to be away from him. He just needed time to get over what I'd done. I was sure that if I gave him a week or two, the sting of what I'd done, and the pain of the quickie divorce would have faded enough for us to talk. I was even more sure that given enough time, I could get him back. It was about a month later that fate played its biggest, sickest joke on me. I'd been feeling fairly shitty for a few days and decided to go to my doctor to find out what was going on with me. I got the happiest feeling when she told me that I was pregnant. I patted my stomach all the way home. Even though you couldn't see anything different, I knew that right there in my belly was my biggest chance to get Bryce back. I was so excited that I could barely breathe. He changed his number, but that didn't matter. I went to see his mom. I heard from him less than an hour later. His call put me on top of the world. 
We started talking again in earnest then. We talked about names and what we wanted. He brought up child support and visitation and I said no. I told him that he had to be a part of his child's life. I want my baby to grow up seeing its daddy every day. I told him. I want my baby to grow up in a loving, stable home, like you had. Our baby deserves better than to be brought up in a dysfunctional circus, like I was. For the good of our child, we have to find a way to get past our issues. He hung up on me, but he called me back a couple of days later. He told me that when the baby was born he'd move back. Why can't I move to where you are? I asked. I could use a new start too. Whatever you want, he said sounding more like my Bryce than ever. Over the next few weeks, while waiting for my pregnancy to advance far enough for the baby to be safely tested, we became partners of a sort. We fell into an easy, long-distance relationship. He did the goofiest things too. He did things that made me love him even more. He had a habit of having me put the phone on my tummy so he could talk to the baby. I was in heaven all over again. In a world where life tended to shit on you, I was granted a second chance. And then like Lucy, pulling that football away from Charlie Brown, fate snatched it away from me. The DNA came back negative. Bryce was not the father. And my life has descended farther into hell every day since. But now with me facing yet another problem, I had nowhere to turn. The paperwork had been filed, so the state would track that deadbeat Vincent down. Wherever he was they would take my child support out of his earnings. They would also keep tabs on how much he owed me. The state would front me the child support money from now on, but it would take a month or two to process the paperwork and start me getting the money. I should have signed up for the automatic payments from the beginning, but I trusted Vincent. I'd never thought he would run out on his own child. What kind of father does that? Then I remembered that my own father hadn't been a prince himself. I realized that I had been making the mistake of thinking that Vincent was like Bryce. Since Bryce would have done the right things, I assumed that Vincent would have as well. As much as I hated doing it, I called Bryce's mother. As usual, he called me back within a couple of hours. I explained my situation to him tearfully. I asked him if he could possibly give me an advance on the next month's alimony payment. I hated asking him for money when he'd always done his part. Bryce's alimony deposits were never late and were often early. The only thing he could have done better would have been to forgive me and take me back. His answer shocked me. No, he said, flat out. I guess I'd have expected him to at least say something like, I'm sorry Evelyn, but I don't have any money to spare this month, or at least something to make it seem like he had an ounce of compassion. Well thanks anyway, I said. Thanks for listening to my problems. Evelyn, I'll give you some money, he said, but not as an advance on your alimony. If I did it that way, you'd just come up short next month. I have some money that I've been saving for a house. I haven't even begun looking yet, and I have no one to share a house with anyway. I'm warm and fed and my girl has her own garage, so we're okay. When he said his girl, I knew who he was talking about. Bryce had replaced his ancient Camaro with a newer model. I had no idea what model or year it was, but my husband loved Camaros like a mother. Well, most mothers love their babies. I was still having trouble believing that the man I'd hurt most wanted to help me and my baby when her own father had run out on us. Let me off the phone so I can put the money in your account, he said. I wanted to say, you know, I wanted more than anything to keep talking to him. But at the same time, I was on the verge of tears. By Bryce? And thanks, I managed to say before I broke down. A few moments later, a chirp from my phone let me know that Bryce had given me some money. I wasn't worried about how much it was. As long as I could give my landlord something, he'd work with me. I was shocked. Bryce had given me enough to pay my rent and then have a little bit left over. His generosity had me crying all over again. It wasn't just the money. It was the totality of what I'd lost. Let's check the story from Carmen's side. I looked across the floor of the plant. I tried for years to like the place, but I had failed miserably. I'd come home a week before Christmas and my entire life had changed. A big part of that was this place. I was due back at school on January the 8th and everything seemed so different. I'd come home with a sense of dread. I foresaw arguments with my dad about my future. I foresaw my mother springing to my defense and forcing my father to give me the money for another semester's tuition. It's not that my father doesn't love me or that he's a cheapskate. My father will buy me anything I ask for without hesitation. The problem is that we both see my future differently. He has no idea what kind of future my dancing could bring me. On the other hand, just being in this place, this sterile mechanical and robotic palace has no soul. I feel as if just being here drains the joy from me. My initial plan, as mercenary as it seems, was to dash home, dance a lot, and then dance my butt right back to school the day after New Year's. So, there I was, trying to make myself like this place by spending some time here. 
I figured if I could dance here, maybe the joy of dancing would make me more comfortable here. I got there early, and just as I started doing a few easy leaps and turns to warm up, there he was. I almost fell on my, but as he looked at me, it was like running full tilt into a brick wall. For most of my life, I've been stared at by guys. I'm used to it. It's a big part of my life. Every performer gets used to the fact that a big part of their presentation lies in their personal attractiveness. Most of the guys I dance with are gay. So, they look at me like I'm a part of the furniture. Putting their hands on me or my legs as part of a dance means absolutely nothing to them. The guys who watch me dance give me a totally different experience. Having their eyes on my body doesn't turn me on, but I've grown accustomed to it. After all, I grew up with two older brothers, so I kind of know what guys think about women. The way he looked at me was completely different. His gaze felt like a beam of sunshine after a long cold winter. He didn't ogle me or my legs. He wasn't staring at my boobs. It was as if he saw me. I felt as if he caught a glimpse of my soul. The funny thing was that, it wasn't mutual. He was trying so hard to keep himself under wraps. He was adorable as he tried to get me to leave. It was so funny. First, he tried to get me to leave. Then he tried to find out if I belonged there. Then he threatened to call the police. He ended up calling my parents. He had no idea who I was, and that part was mutual. But I didn't care who he was. And I didn't have to know who he was to know that I liked him. A lot. So, I started coming here a lot. I pumped my family for everything they knew about him. And they all liked him. Even my brothers. That was surprising because my brothers hated every guy that I liked. My brother Marco told me not to start anything with Bryce. He's a good guy, but there's something broken about him, he warned. I don't want to see you hurt, or him either. He's a really good programmer. My brother Diego saw it differently. He burst out laughing. Don't even think about it, sis, he laughed. It will never work. You guys are like peanut butter and tuna fish. You're all artsy, and you go by feelings. Bryce is so into his robots and computer-controlled cutting machines that he's like one of them. But let me warn you about something. Dad has plans for Bryce. And Marco and I like the plans. What plans? I ask. Don't you ever listen when we talk at dinner? He asked. Just spill it, I said. Dad wants what he always wants, he said. He wants the business bigger. Marco and I want to be out from under Dad's shadow and away from this goddamned machine shop. Marco wants to be in charge of sales. I want to start and run our marketing department. We need someone to replace Ed Wilson. I know he's dad's best friend, but as long as he's here slowing things down and resisting change, we're not going anywhere. So how does Bryce fit in? I asked. Bryce loves this grubby factory, he said. He's made more improvements in production in the six months that he's been here than we've made in the last five years. Ed gets all the credit, but really, he's just in the way. So, if you mess Bryce up, we're all screwed. So what kind of women does he date? I threw out. Well, the one he has now is black, with green eyes and she's kind of wide, he said. What color is her hair? I asked. I remembered that he seemed to be fascinated by my red hair. No hair, he said. She's bald? I asked in surprise. She's a car, he laughed. His car is that glass black 2012 Camaro GT with a wide body kit. He throws a ton of money into that car and, and I'm gonna kick your butt if you don't. I began. Carmen, he doesn't, he said seriously. Several of the women in the office and on the floor have taken a stab at him. He's just not interested. After that I found myself dropping by the plant a lot more often than I wanted to admit. But like my brother said, Bryce was always alone. It broke my heart. I figured that I would take my own stab at him at the company Christmas party. We had two holiday-themed events every year. The Christmas party was a formal type event. My dad gave out bonuses and promotions and awards for hard work and excellence. Bryce had gotten a nice bonus and several awards for his work, but he hadn't attended the party. The New Year's Eve party is much less formal and a lot more fun. It had almost nothing to do with business. I'd been pretty sure that there was even less of a chance of Bryce attending that. That was of course before my mother got involved. So here I was, standing just across the floor from him. I was in the safety zone. I had on safety glasses, but I'll be damned if I was gonna wear those boots. So I stayed outside of the lines. I have no idea whether I was nervously excited, or simply terrified. I felt like I was back in high school trying to get the coolest guy in school to notice me. Actually, I had no trouble with that. It felt weird, being here. This was his domain. I wondered if he would welcome me, or treat me as if I was an annoyance. I'd heard so many different stories about him. There was the one where he tore a salesman a new a-hole for putting a coffee cup on one of the robots. There was the one where he referred to all the machines and robots by names that he gave them. 
There was even the one where Bryce programmed one of the robots to get him sodas from the small refrigerator he kept on the floor near the simulator he used to test out programs before sending them to the various machining centers. There was another thing. Technically, my dad's friend Ed oversaw production. He was the production manager. There was also an assistant production manager who was different from Ed's personal assistant. Although, technically, he ran it. Neither Ed nor his assistants ever went on the floor. It all came down to Bryce. He didn't have any kind of title. He didn't have any assistants, unless you count the operators, and he didn't think he was their boss. In fact, he looked at it as if he worked for them. But if anyone needed any kind of information about what jobs we were running or their status, they went to Bryce. It was sometimes embarrassing for Ed and his assistants to tell a prospective customer something, only to have Bryce pull them off the floor and tell them in private that they couldn't do something because of a scheduling conflict or because we flat out didn't do something. I remember my dad laughing and running over to the side to avoid embarrassing Ed, while Bryce explained to him that we didn't do injection molding or friction welding. Then Ed would grumble something like, what's the difference? Or, how the hell was I supposed to know that? Truthfully, I've always been kind of frightened by those huge machines, but I liked Bryce enough to brave his territory. I waved at him to get his attention. I smiled my brightest smile, and he waved me over. I pointed down at my feet, and he nodded. He picked up a rag and threw it at the robot that was taking parts from a pallet near him. The robot stopped in midair and went dormant. He then waved me over again. I stayed inside of the lines until I was near him and then smiled at him again. Miss Velasco, he said. Bryce, you know we're not that kind of family. I laughed. Please, call me Carmen. He nodded. I could tell that he was wondering what the hell I wanted. I was taking in every aspect of him. His tousled dirty blonde hair and two-day beard growth gave him that bad boy look. He was slim but muscular. But he wasn't so muscular as to be a member of the Steroid of the Month Club. He, strangely enough, was built like a dancer. Something about him drew me in though. Perhaps it was those deep blue eyes that seemed to have seen too much sadness for his age. Something in me would die to see him smile. As he stood there in front of me, my life changed. Older people like my mom always talk about things that no one believes. Like she'd often told me how he first time she saw my father. She knew she was going to marry him my brothers, and I were sure that she was full of it. My dad always laughs about it too. She was cute, he says, but at the time I wasn't interested in that type of girl. What type of girl was she? We asked. You mom wasn't exactly friendly, if you know what I mean, he said. That's bull, laughed my mom. I was very friendly. What he means is that I didn't put out. My mind had drifted. A quick movement snapped me back to the present. He was looking at his watch. How many suits do you own? I asked him. I could see that my question caught him flat-footed. His eyes quickly darted to one of his machines. I got the feeling that he was afraid and drawing on the machine for strength. None, he said. I'm a grunt, ma'am. Suits are for management types like Ed or Brian. I get oil and coolant all over me sometimes. Jeans or dickies can be washed a million times and come back from that. It was nice talking to you. Who said we were done? I asked him. As soon as the words came out of my mouth, I knew I had to fix it. Bryce? are you afraid of me? I asked. I thought we were friends. No, ma'am. I mean, I'm not afraid of you and if you say so, we're friends, ma'am. I mean, Miss Velasco, he said. I realized then that like my mom said, this was going to take some work. Bryce, I have to ask you something, I said. But I'm going to go talk to my uncle at first, okay? Yes, ma'am, he said. A few minutes later, I was walking up the stairs to my uncle Ed's office. He had the curtains drawn so no one could see inside. His secretary and both of his assistants were sitting at desks in the outer office. The secretary, Diana, was on Facebook. The assistant production manager, Todd, was looking through a car magazine and Ed's personal assistant, Brian, was playing a video game on his company computer. Todd looked over at me and smiled as I walked through. Somehow just the way his eyes raked my body made me feel dirty and greasy. Carmen, when are we going to stop pretending that there's nothing going on between us and do something about it? He asked. Two things, I said. There are two things that you got wrong. First, your management, right? A part of your job is maintaining professionalism in the workplace. What if we went out and things didn't work out? Then we'd have all kinds of problems with potential sexual harassment in the workplace claims. So, one of us would have to be let go. His gulp was so loud that the other two people in the room heard it and laughed. The second thing is that I don't work here, Todd. So, you and I are only acquaintances and I don't remember giving you permission to call me anything other than Miss Velasco. I was brutal with Todd because I knew his type. Todd was a snake. 
It wasn't enough that he had a very cushy job for which he was very well paid for doing next to nothing. He wanted to advance even more. That way he could do even less and get paid even more. Todd had been staring at me like a snake since I was a teenager. I knew his type. He wanted to screw me and use it to get ahead in my father's company. But as brutal as I's been with him, I knew he'd be back. His type couldn't take no for an answer. His persistence was based on the fact that me telling him no a thousand times didn't matter because all I had to do was say yes once and his life would change. Hi, Carmen, smiled the secretary. She was barely able to avoid laughing at Todd. This is the fourth time you've been in this building this week. What's up? Your dad putting pressure on you to earn that tuition money. I just laughed. It was a breezy, friendly laugh, but inside, I was pissed. I walked into my uncle's office. Ed wasn't my uncle, but he was both my godfather and my dad's lifelong best friend. He didn't even notice me. He was extremely busy trying to put a golf ball into one of those practice thingies and mumbling to himself. This thing is useless, he mumbled. All of that goddamn money I spent, and it won't hit straight for shit. I crept up behind him and blew a gust of air on the back of his neck just as he started to swing. Taia, what the? He screamed, dropping the putter and almost falling. Margie, what? You scared the shit out of me, he gushed. I went behind him and looked at his flabby old butt. Yeah, I said. I can see the stain. You and see. Those pants are ruined. What? He said. Then he looked at me. Margie, you'd better be good. I can still take you over my knee little girl. His face broke out in a smile and I did too. I loved my uncle, but I was very frustrated. I hugged him. My uncle had been there when my dad first started the business in the garage of our first tiny house. I, of course, wasn't even born then. Margie, this, this, he sputtered. I know you and see, I smiled. That putter doesn't work. I bent down and picked it up. With one hand, I smacked the ball. Absent-mindedly, I didn't care about the ball or the hole. The ball traveled across the floor, up the ramp, and dropped into the hole. My uncle's eyes bugged out. Then he got pissed. What do you need, Margie? He asked. I handed him the putter back and he looked at it, as if seeing it for the first time. Bryce, I said. He stopped looking at the putter and dropped it again. I need you to give him the afternoon off, I said. He looked shocked. Not gonna happen, he said. Margie, it's not me. It's him. I think the guy lives here. He gets here early in the morning. And he's still here after everyone leaves. You'd think with him getting here so goddamned early that he'd save us some time by. Turning the lights on and getting everything prepped? I said. Nah. He does all of that, said Ed. But I usually have to send Brian or Rose out to get us coffee and donuts. It would be great if he stopped and did it sometimes. You and see. Does he eat the donuts or drink the coffee? I asked. Nope. That stuff stays in the office, he said. Does Bryce have a desk in the office? I asked. Of course not, he laughed. The office is for management staff. We have to keep this place running. Okay. I said. I'm taking him for the afternoon. You can't, he said. He won't go. And what if something happens while he's gone? I swear he can talk to those machines. What do you do when he gets sick? I asked. Or goes on vacation. He comes to work when he's sick, he said and he takes his vacation time during that summer period when they come in to inspect the furnace and the building and all of that crap. We shut down production for a whole week. We'll figure it out, don't see, I said. He's going with me whether he likes it or not. I explained to him what I wanted and why. It soothed his feathers a bit, but he was still extremely nervous. A few moments later, I was back on the floor waving at Bryce, yet again. He was in a completely different area of the large production floor. He was buried deep in the back. He had his head inside the cavity of one of the machines. There were two of our operators watching him. He pointed out something to them and then went over to a console and started the machine. The operator gave him the thumbs up sign and then pointed towards me. I smiled again. My brother's words came back to me. My father, unlike Ed, was no dummy. My dad knew what was going on in the plant. What's wrong with your leg? He asked in a small voice. Sorry, he said immediately. How did you? I began. It's my knee. I sprained it the other day. How did you know? Your walk is different, he said. The first time I saw you, it was almost as if... He stopped talking abruptly. As if what? I asked. I was ready for it. I felt for a moment as if I was back to being a high school cheerleader, and he was one of the football players. I was ready for it. It was gonna be a crack about my assets. Mr. Callahan was about to find out that I gave as good as I got. My smile broadened. I realized that some playful banter between us might lighten the mood. So. Like a championship tennis player, I got ready to receive his serve and give it back. It was unfair. Bryce had too many weaknesses. 
his bizarre connection to those dumb machines, his failed marriage, the fact that he was always alone, as if what? I asked again. Well, you're so graceful. It's almost as if you don't really need to touch the ground like the rest of us, he said, and his eyes dropped to the floor. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that. I thought I was ready. But how the hell can anyone be ready for something like that? It's almost like when he described me to my mom over the phone, he turned away and covered his mouth as if he didn't want me to hear what he'd said about me. As if any woman wouldn't want to hear that she was beautiful. Even the word felt strange. Most guys just said that you were good looking, or hot, or sexy. A few said that you were pretty, but Bryce told my mom that I was beautiful. I felt like I should just run away until I knew how to handle the feelings going through me. You need a suit to wear to the New Year's Eve party, I said. I'm not going, he said quietly. Yeah, you are, I snorted. You're getting another award or something. It was really embarrassing at the Christmas party when they kept calling your name and you weren't there. Ma'am, you said we were friends, right? He said. If I get some kind of award, couldn't you get it for me? I was sure that I had broken out in a rash when he said it. He turned that warm smile on me, and it felt like a little boy trying to charm his mother into picking up his homework for him and letting him stay home from school. When those blue eyes hit me, I saw my kids. My brain ran through all kinds of scenarios. Picking up his award for him would make all the women at the plant think there was something going on between us, so they'd back the hell off and give me time to work on him. But at the same time, I don't know how or why, but suddenly I had a bigger interest in my father's company. And it just seemed strange to me that on the production side, Bryce seemed to be, as my brothers had claimed, doing all of the work while our management staff sat on their butts and did nothing. I decided to talk to my mom about what I'd seen and let her talk to my D. That was the answer. All I had to do was bring out my big gun. Bryce, my mom wants you to be there, I said. The change in him was immediate. So immediate, in fact, that I felt a tinge of jealousy. Okay, he said. Can I go after work, though? The stores will still be open and I have a lot to do? I tried not to show how angry I was on all fronts. First, I was angry at my mother. How the hell could she hold so much influence over him, especially when she wasn't even there? And secondly, I was so pissed at my uncle and his staff of freeloaders that I could barely see straight. But I swallowed the anger and smiled. Okay, I'll wait for you, I smiled. Why? He asked. Where are you going to buy your suit? I asked. There's a place in the mall that sells suits, he said. It's called Suit Barn and they won't be seeing you anytime soon, I said cutting him off. That's why I'm going with you. I'll meet you back here as soon as your shift is over. But I have to, he whined. You have to have your butt back here at four o'clock sharp, I smiled. Dear listeners, the next part will be out soon. Meanwhile, please share your thoughts in the comments section below and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.